Okay. All right. So, yeah. Morning, everybody. Let's try to continue as normal. Just one thing. Are you with me on that? Just in general, if you're not feeling well or so, let us know. And it's better to stay at home in the hotel first. If you're afraid of losing, of not being able to catch up with something, no problem. Let us know. I would be more than happy to re give the lecture, for example, or individually. So, health first. We're going to get you through the rest. Yeah. All right. So, but today, let's get started. And uh, we have a lot of program today, technically. And this is going to be the list. In general, we're going to have two different blocks that I would like to convey to you today. One is to get, to get a bit more started with the workspace setup so they can start coding properly since you now have all the GitHub and VM access figured out. And then we're going to finally go into deep learning, which is going to be what we're doing for the rest of the three weeks. But let's get started um, with the workspace setup. So first message of the day, do it properly and do it now. And what I mean by that is perhaps you have so far the just opening your code editor, making files, putting the data in the same folder, trying to code one thing after the other, and it turned into what we call spaghetti code, which is one file of very big code, and it gets you get lost in the end. That's good for getting exploring concepts, but once you start doing a project, you want to do it well. You want to organize your code folder so that you, after six months, you know exactly what you have done, and that other people who want to use your code can reproduce your results. Reproducibility is key in science. And this also pertains to code. So, again, you want to separate code from experiments from data. This might sound a bit illogical because you just, some of you are using just one data set. But it could be that you're using another one. Or maybe you want to subsample your data set and try on a particular region of if you have camera traps or even sending data. If you have your data set hard coded in your code, you cannot change that easily. It's gonna get it's gonna turn into a mess. So you want your code in general to be independent from the data. And also you don't want to upload your data to GitHub. A, you can't of this because of the size, and B. You don't want to disclose it the same way. You really want to separate that. And you also want to separate your experiment. Oh, I'm going to get into that. Then you want to be able to explain how to get your code running and how to reproduce the results. Also for yourself, I said, it happened to all of us. You get back to your code a half a year later and you don't know what you've done. It's really bad. You want to make it reproducible. Again, key in science. And you want to define policies. This is also important because you sure you want to get started with the core of your project. You want to get coded and so on. You're going to get hacked away with coding. But once you share this, once you put it public on GitHub, for example, you want to define how others can use this. We're in a science world, so we're kind of depending on innocent terrain, but still you want to define this. So one good way of doing this, it's not the only way, but that's something I could recommend, is something like this. Let's say you have at the top your base project folder. Let's just call this camera trapinator. That's just, let's say this is the name of your project. Give it a fancy name. That's the same name you're going to be using on GitHub in your project. And in there, you have a couple of other folders. And I'm going to go through them one by one. But the first one is this .it folder. That's usually hidden. And this is what sets up your Git or GitHub or GitLab repository. You can do that by going into that folder and in terminal typing Git in it. This is what allows you to synchronize with the repository using Git pull, Git push, Git commit, whatever. That's going to be there with that. Then, very important, you have a readme file. And this is the welcome screen. Uh, when you open a project on GitHub, this is going to show you what's, what's going on. By the way, you don't need to take too many notes if you want. I'm going to share all of that material with you. Yes. So this is formatted in Markdown, which is a bit of a special formatting syntax, but it's not so difficult. You, uh, there's cheat sheets about that. 
And this usually contains an overview of what your project is about. And some background maybe, like what you're using it for, like what the data set, what the application is and so on. Very important installation instructions so that you, again, can reproduce how to get the code running. Usage instructions, like for example, how to train your deep learning model, how to use it for testing on your data set. And then very important citation information. So generally, I recommend don't make your repository public unless you have a paper out of it. Otherwise, someone's going to go ahead, grab it, and publish before you. You don't want this to happen. So once you have a paper, make it public, put the paper in there and say, if you want to use this repository, please cite this paper. Got it. Put your so, citation card up as well. I like slightly disagree with that. And okay. it's mostly just because um, for all of you, most of what is going to make your projects possible is going to be the data. Um, and I'm not imagining that this code is going to be very different from already existing, at least the first already existing open source things. So people aren't going to be able to steal your project without your data. The data really is your power here. And I think that there's a lot of, especially for this group, there's gonna be a lot of benefits on these repositories being public so that you can see each other's code and share each other's code easily. And also, I, I just don't think you're gonna get scooped because they don't have your data, so they can't do your research. No, it's not the rule. It can happen. It has, it has <laughs> happened in our group already. But still. Like, yeah. nobody. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna look for us. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> like, about the I can barely world. find my own stuff when I want for context, <laughs> I've always made all my GitHub public pretty much and never then speak because nobody's working on the problems I'm working on. So it's like if it's something specific. But I think this does definitely happen in machine learning, especially if you're working on like core machine learning stuff. <laughs> because there can be a bit more cutthroat, I think. Yeah, it's happened to one of my colleagues who works more. For you, if you have applications, it's not. Still, you want to be careful. Okay, next file, the requirements. Um, this is a file that lists all the Python libraries and packages that you use. Again, that's for reproducibility, and it makes installation a lot easier. So let me go through how to create that file and what this looks like. So this that text in a fixed width font is an example of what a of the contents of a requirements file. You can see here we have, for example, uh, a comment here in green with the hash symbol. Then we have, you see it there, it says at the top pandas and then greater or equal one for one. That's the minimal version of the library package you've been using. You can do that and then you can make sure that when someone installs, it gets updated to the latest version. For stuff like pandas, that's perfectly fine. For more important packages, like for example, PyTorch, you want to do this, the double equals, which means you fix, you pin the version of PyTorch, or Torch Vision in this case, to what you've used. Yes? What's an auxiliary package? Like it's something that, like for example, Pandas that uh, is used for data reading and so on, or data formatting. It's like, I, it's just, it's, the boundaries are blurry. I would say, for example, PyTorch, there's a lot of changes happening every now and then. And you want to be, and that's important for your actual deep learning model. So you want to fix that to the version you've used. Also, because sometimes there's bugs, and then people can reproduce why something happens in your code. It's generally good practice. Yes. Uh, oh, is this the same as like a a conda yaml file? I'll get to that in a second. Oh, yes. okay. that's the alternative way of doing it. Gotcha. Yeah. Do you generate this file yourself or? Uh, I'll get to that as well now. <laughs> Good questions. Uh, yes, so just one last thing. That's a bit of a speciality because for this on an auxiliary branch, so I need to add this. I'll give you an example of that at the end of the lecture. Now, how to generate this? That's subjective. I personally generate it manually because I want to only list the packages I actively installed and not the auxiliary stuff. So I do it like that. You can create it uh, automatically with these commands. I say they're not a good idea, but that's just, that's my taste. If you like it, use it. And that's for the pip style. Pip is one of the package managers. If you want it, and uh, if you want to be conda, I'll give you instructions on that as well. You can also use it with conda, then it's a slightly different for the syntax. I think I have it somewhere, but it's slight or a messed up. Next thing, you, when I have a license in there, that's, you can actually put that there at the end. That defines how to share, how others can use your code when you share it. 
I have some examples here, like the MIT license or the maybe sort of Creative Commons. Uh, you can go through that in detail at, at the moment. It's not so important, just I recommend putting one. Oh, yeah, here's the Conda way of doing things. I got messed up. That's what the Conda environment file looks like. And this you can create automatically, like this. So once you have your environment, your virtual Conda environment ready, you can use these commands to export that to what's called a YAML file which is a special type of non-markup language definition. And then with that, you can just recreate your environment with one command and it installs all the packages automatically. You add that to, to your Git repository. Sorry, you do this on the notepad or whatever is this the notepad in your system and then save it with YAML, right? Yes, yeah, so what you do is you, this, Command conda int export, you do that on the command line in your workspace. Yeah. When you have your environment active. Yeah, that document. Where do you create it? And then what this does, you see this this pipe, and then it creates a file called environment.yaml in the current you're, directory. You're using it from your environment, so next time. Exactly. You have okay. You're, and it lists all those packages for you. So you you you're dumping all these pack packages yeah. into file environment.yaml. And this file you can add to the GitHub. I guess I was still thinking about the requirement. file. It's exactly the same principle, just this is for Conda, the previous one was for Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood. Did you, you said you prefer to write it out manually. Yeah, that's just me. I use a requirements file because pip is more universally used than Conda. Okay. And I write it manually because then I only list the packages I installed. Like if you install PyTorch, okay. it comes with a million other packages. Right. But mm -hmm. they get uh, the file gets messy and you don't know what actually is being used. Like With that, okay. I really. So if you do the pip freeze bit like that, it's that just like everything that you like this. It's the same as this, but it's pip syntax. Yes. Like loads of other packages. Also works, but yeah, it just gets a bit more cluttered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would you ever do the pip freeze and generate automatically and then just go through and delete the messy stuff? So it's like a hybrid version? No, you do the pip freeze, just leave the file as it is. Okay. <laughs> Because then it really pins all the packages we used. Otherwise, it might complain that some are missing. <laughs> yeah. Just either define a manually or use conda export or pip freeze and then just leave the files as they are. Yes. Just briefly, I see YAML with an A and I see YAML. What's the difference? It's the same. Okay. So it's like JPG and JPEG. Yeah. That's from old Windows, those times when file extensions were only three letters. Mm -hmm. But these days they can be as long as you want. So it's compatibility. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Right. Then, next file. That, that's actually a file, not a folder, sorry. Uh, .git ignore. That's important. That allows you to specify stuff that should not be pushed to the Git thread. And you can see some examples here. First one is some code editor configurations. Like if you're using Visual Studio Code, you get this hidden folder .vs code. You don't want to be pushing that to GitHub. No one cares about your VS code set. <laughs> then Python compiles your code at runtime. It creates cache files. These are binary files. And again, you don't want to be pushing that because People can, there, can compile that themselves using Python, and it depends on the platform. Put them in. Stuff like if you have your deep learning model and you save them to intermediate, you save the weights to different uh, files. You don't want to be pushing that because these files are huge, and again, no one cares about the intermediate model states. That's like the intermediate output. Um, so when you train a deep learning model, you do that in epochs of which means full one epoch is a full iteration over your data set. And usually at the end of the epoch, you save it. And what I do is I save one model set every epoch, and this can get very long, big files. You don't need epoch zero, for example. If you want to provide one, provide the latest epoch. Just temporary cache files in the sense that you don't want to be pushing to it. And then stuff if you have log files and so on as well. Yes. So you're being manually putting it to many things. This you can put manually. I can give I can give you a git ignore file that has most of the common stuff included. But you just kind of add one or two folders that you have. Like for example, so if you have a data set folder, you want to don't want to put that in, put it into the git ignore and it doesn't get synchronized. Yes. Yeah, so in the git ignore file, you don't actually have to specify that 
this directory that like those files are in, you just do like the flag for the file extension. There's different. There's the, it, it works a bit like in uh, like regular expressions. So okay. there's different ways of doing it. You can provide the folder path. You can provide asterisk, as you can see oh, here. Uh, and then it just it, it works like that. You can okay. provide these wild cards. Yeah, and also on macOS, you're going to have this hidden, hidden system file like .ds store. Put that in because then Windows and Linux users are just not going to like it if they download these useless files. Right, then that's actually the most interesting part. Your main code goes here. And again, this is subjective. I recommend make the code, make one folder where all your code goes and name it the same as your project, for example, or name it code. Just that. It is logically organized. So there is where you put all the Python facts. Right. Then you want to publish that. I heard you've all been using Git, GitHub, and so on. If not, do it now. Again. If you feel like your project is not worth it, then the whole project is not worth it. So publishing it is very important because that is gives you a backup of your code in the cloud. You better make a backup locally as well. And you're going to set it up properly from the start. So it's a bit more effort at the, at the beginning. But then once you publish it, you can just release the code to be used by others or by you when you come back to it. You can synchronize it to your VM. It's a bit of an extra mile in the beginning, but do it. You're going to save you a lot of time. So this was basically the code setup. I think if you follow these uh, steps, I think you're going to be ready to just get hacked away. Yes. Um, so if you're gonna cover this later, but where does your data fit into that like data? Good structure? question. Uh, I recommend that you again separate data from code. So this is subjective. What I do, this individual, I keep my data on a, even a separate drive inside my computer. Oh, okay. I have a folder called data sets where I put all the data, and I have a folder called projects where I put all the GitHub code. For you. You don't necessarily need to do that. You can have the data in your project folder, but then please add it to the git ignore. Right. That's, I'm going to show you an example at the end. We're going to do exactly this. So with that, if you have one data set or even multiple data sets associated with just one project, you can keep everything in one folder. Just and then make sure not to push it to git. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask if you can add it to git. Exactly. So, Let's get into the actual coding. And uh, this is something I first did not want to include because this is not supposed to be a computer science lecture, but I've heard interest among the group who want to know about this. Who of you has heard about object oriented programming? Okay, and who of you hates it? Okay, there's one, because <laughs> I heard that comment. The story is uh, for deep learning, we're going to be using a little bit of this. It's not super advanced but just a bit. We're going to use that somewhat, and I'm going to give you just a primer of the basics. If it's if you know it already, if it's too slow, let me know. I can speed up. So, so far, you have been, most of you have been probably using, doing that. You open the Jupyter Notebook, and you just make some blocks and code sets, and you just put code one line after the other. You perhaps have made some functions somewhere, but it's all been one big, long code. A script, basically. That's fine, but that's a bit limited in flexibility. Because what we want to do now is we want to go into this idea of object-oriented programming, which is a bit of a different concept, but it allows us to be a lot more flexible in how we program stuff. It allows us to actually save a lot of coding and organize things more neatly. So the way this works is <coughs> it's like a metaphor of the real world, where we have Imagine, for example, you have the concept of species, and for every species, you have individuals. Here, we're going to have to say, in a programming world, you have an object class, which corresponds to your species, and this is kind of a blueprint. It has properties and functionality. So, for example, you have, if you have a species called dog, then it has properties, like it has four paws, <coughs> and it has functionality. It can bark. <laughs> and then, what you can do is you can instantiate object instances. These correspond to your species individuals. And so these are actual examples for objects 
with property values. So you don't just you have, you have properties like for, or like functions, for example, make sound. And then here, this instance can actually make a sound that sounds like barking or bellowing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you have properties like number of legs, and then the dog, the dog instance is going to say number of legs equals four. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do exactly the same for programming. And uh, so let's say we have, let's take that example, we have an object class, let's make it even a bit more general, called animal. And we have properties like the species, the age, sex, etc. You, you can add as many as you want. And this animal can have has capabilities, abilities, like functions in this case. You can define functions that we can call on these animals, that make sound. But you don't know what kind of sound this makes because this is just a general animal. But this is just a blueprint. And what we can do then is create instances. So we can say the first animal is a cat. It is for age 12 and it is a male cat. So we make examples, instances of these blueprints by filling in these attributes like species, age, sex, and so on. And make a second animal. Like this case, it's a dog. It's three years old and it's female. And I think if you, the, the reason behind this is that you don't need to define an individual cat or an individual dog, of, or if you have 10,000 cats, you don't need to redefine that 10,000 times to define one class and you just throw 10,000 instances which is a lot more easy to do with programming. Is this when you're teaching the model? Is this when you're teaching the model? Or no? no. What, what part of the, of the model building is concept? Um, OK, I can jump a bit ahead, because that was at the end. Uh, for models, you can, you can imagine that, for example, a model is a class, right? And then its properties could be its parameters. And so you have different instances of a model. For example, if you want to compare two models, you can have two different instances, each with their own parameters. Or if you have a generic model, like, I don't know, let's say a ResNet 50, and one predicts 10 classes, one predicts 60 classes. These are instances of the same model, it's the same uh, the same class, okay. but with different numbers of outputs. Would that be what is run in different virtual machines, if you're running more? This doesn't hardware? depend. No, no, no it's, it's all on the same virtual machine. This is all just in one, in one running in one computer. Okay. For example, let's say you want to train your model. You've heard Sarah's excellent lecture yesterday on splits. You can have a class called dataset. And then you can draw two instances. One is the training dataset, one is the test dataset. Oh, yeah. okay. They're both the same type, but they have different properties. One has the training images, one has the test images. This is, you only need to define it once, and then you can draw instances as you go along. Yes? In that same example, could you have class data set instance one and split the data one way and split the data another way? If there was some subjectivity in how you were splitting? Absolutely, yeah. You can really, I mean, this, this is just a general concept. You can, if you, you can, you have to think about how you logically group your entities into classes, and then you can draw instances anyway you want. Yes. Is something like a numpy array a class that has like properties like the numbers and then functions and also like do things? Exactly. Okay. A numpy array is a class. A torch tensor is a class. A, the deep learning model in PyTorch is a class. A layer is a class. You've been using classes all the time. You just didn't know. <laughs> so it's 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 such an ubiquitous concept. It's really very widespread. And so when you have this blueprint, let's say this class. This is what it looks like in Python. <laughs> so this is how you define a class in Python. In this case, we're going to take a verbal team and define an animal class. You say there is a keyword class animal. That's the name of the class. And then in here, you have two functions. You see the def means define. That defines a function. And uh, what you can see in there is, first of all, you see exactly these attributes that we specified. So this animal has these three properties here. And what we can do is we can say this class has species, age, and sex as attributes. And this magic keyword self means that this inst the instance of this class is going to have these properties for itself. And uh, you can see this is defined at the top there. And this weird double underscore init double underscore, that is what's called a constructor. 
and this constructs an instance of your class. So this is basically a function that gets called when you create a new instance, for example, when you create a new cat or a new dog, whatever, and give it all the attributes. And you can do anything you want in this constructor. This is just the stuff, the function that gets your instance ready. So this is, for example, when you have a data set class, this is where you can low, uh, find out where all your data points are, for example. Uh, anything clear so, everything's clear so far? Any questions? Okay. And then, you, I guess you see where this is going. You can define other functions in this class. In this case, we have another function, def make sound. And here, again, you can do whatever you want. It just has to be sensible. So this case is borderline sensible, but you, it's just for demonstration. We have this function, make sound, mm -hmm. and you can see what's happening here. Uh, it has an, first, it has an argument, a variable self. You always put this in the class functions. You always have this self, so you can access the class instance own properties. So in this case, we do that. We say, if self.species mm -hmm. is a cat, you print meow, otherwise you print boof because it's a dog. <laughs> so you see, you see where this is going, I guess. And with that, you can really define abilities of a class depending on its parameters. So for example, if you have a data set class, you can say you're gonna have an, a function called get item, which gives you a data point at a, uh, in your data set. And depending on if it's a training or a test data set, it's gonna give you different results, right? But the function is the same, no matter if it's a train or a test data set. The general function, the blueprint is the same. Right. Uh, That's a second instance, the second part, right? Uh, Make sound. That would be a second instance? That's a function of your general class. Okay. That's not an instance. You have a class, which is the blueprint, okay. and an instance, which is a, a version of your blueprint with big properties. So, like, you can have. If you have a class cat, then instance could be, if you have two cats, they are two different instances. Okay. And, yeah. Okay. Can we think of this kind of like, if this is a, like a data set, each of the properties is a column? You can specify this if you want. So properties in a data set, properties could be, uh, for example, if you're working on images, properties could be a list of images and a list of labels. Mm -hmm. And then of course, if you have a function get item, get at position x, you return the image and the label at that position. Okay. Yeah, and you can have other metadata. Yeah. So properties are, I mean, in principle, in the blueprint, properties are just the variable names. Yeah. Okay. And in an instance, you fill, you populate these variables with the actual values. So yeah, you can create docs of different ages and whatever. So, and then of course, here's how you actually create instances. You can see this at the bottom. You see at the top is our same animal class as before with the constructor and the make sound function, the, what it can do. And at the bottom we create two animals. And that's exactly what I've shown you before. The first one is our first instance where we say animal one, that's a new variable. We, we want to store this instance in a variable, of course, that equals animal because animal is how we defined our class above. And then just say, you give it the arguments in order. We have, you see, we have self, you don't give that, that's given. We have species, age, and sex. So the species, cat, age, 12, sex, male. And that gives you a cat that is 12 years old and male. And you can do the same with the dog. And of course, analogously, one could be the training set, one could be the validation set, if you have a data set class. And of course, then if you, Call this function make sound on the first on animal one, it's going to output. You guessed it? Yeah, because it's a cat. We defined that in that function. You can see that here. So we have our two instances the cat and the dog. And we say animal one, which is the cat, dot make sound. There's again with the dot and then the function. You've been using that without knowing. It outputs meow because we have defined that. If you do it on a dog, it outputs. Meow. So we use the two instances, but we use the same function, and the function decides what to do depending on the properties of the instance. Mm -hmm. So this is in principle how object oriented programming works. There is a lot more to it which we don't need, 
I think we're going to be good with that. So, yes. So, if this is a might be a tangential question, but if it's not object oriented programming, what what is it oriented towards? If it's not object oriented, you usually call it a script. It's just it's scripting. Script. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So, in principle, for example, most of Python and R are actually scripting languages, and I'm not sure about R, but yeah, Python has some object oriented programming support built in. Yeah. Okay. But in script, you just define one after the other, and then if you have, if you want to have different data sets, you just have to define them twice, okay. even though it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are dictionaries a type of object-oriented programming? Like, if you good question. Dictionaries. Dictionaries. Mm -hmm. Um, technically, they're probably implemented like that. In Python, they are more kind of a primitive data type, like a list. Gotcha. Yeah. But in, but in principle, I guess you could imagine, you could implement your own dictionary in a class. So if you have different different dictionaries with different values, there could be different instances of the dictionary class. It's exactly that. Yes. Are there common classes that, for you all who read these types of codes online, or like see these types of codes in paper, like if we just like suddenly created a class called like, I don't know, like results, would that be like less expected than maybe like a class called data set, a class called model? I guess, is there like some standard for classes that we should be trying to think about for our code? Yes. So in general, you have to be aware that this object or the programming concept of classes only makes sense for when you have entities in your code. A data set is an entity, a model is an entity. But results, yeah. you might have a results class if you have lots of results and you want to group them and you want to have functions applied to common results, mm -hmm. but it's less common to do that. So you can mix the two. You can say, my model is an entity, it's a class, my data set is a class, but the results I just store as, yeah. as floating point values, which is, which is what we're going to do. We'll look into this more in Sarah's lecture tomorrow. We'll go through like open source code bases and point out specifics. So excellent yeah. point. Yeah. I'm basically gonna be going through like how trying yeah. to give you guys the intuition of how I figure out how to get someone else's code to work for my data. <laughs> Useful. <laughs> Very good. All right. And again, this is what we've been talking a lot now. You've been using classes most of the time. You can Here's some here's some sensible ways of using classes. Like on the on the left, you see a random forest classifier, and it has its constructor in it. But if for example, say it has a certain number of trees, if you know random forest, and you have a fit and a predict function. You, I don't know how it is in R. It might be called differently, but you get the idea. One is to train, one is to test. Or in the bottom left, bottom right, you see a model class. That's actually, for example, that could be a deep learning model. It actually is one here. Or in the top right, this is a class called linear. That's what's called a linear layer. And this code is copy paste from PyTorch. That's literally how it is defined in PyTorch. So you see there's a lot of, I mean, it's just a little, it's just a, it's just a constructor, but there's a lot of stuff going on. You don't need to worry. It is exactly a class with an init function. Yes. Why does it say linear in parentheses module? What does that mean? Okay, yeah. That's, uh, don't need to worry about that too much. We're gonna be using that, it's not so important. What this means is if you can put object-oriented programming a step a little further and say you have classes that inherit from each other. Oh, so it's so, like having animal species and then instances. It, like, well, instances instance are still separate, but you have, for example, uh, I don't know, kingdom, genus, family, uh, yeah. species. Because okay. you have some, some classes which share the same ideas. Mm -hmm. For example, in deep learning, uh, a la you have layers, right? So you've heard of convolutional layers, for example, or linear layers. They all have a function called forward. So you can predict, or machine learning models all have a function called fit or predict. And what you can do is you can define a base class, machine learning model, and then a subclass, random forest, generalized linear model, etc., which inherits. That's a bit more advanced object oriented programming. We're going to use it, but don't worry, it's very simple. Yay. Right. So now 
let's finally get into this, into it, with PyTorch and deep learning. So, little preamble, we're gonna recommend PyTorch. If you're already using something like TensorFlow, no problem. It's just, if you're new to deep learning, seriously, go for PyTorch. It's <laughs> simple, it's very fast, and it's very easy to understand. The only reason any of you should use TensorFlow is if basically there exists already an open source code base that is doing very similar to what you want to do that's in TensorFlow. But just know that the debugging will be harder um, and we will help you with it. But PyTorch is definitely a more interpretable language to start with. For sure. Yeah, but we'll, we'll be helping with that. Many of the, concept, the concepts are the same between the two. This, the implementation details are a bit different. One is from Google, one is from Facebook. We use the Facebook one. <laughs> Honestly, a lot of people at Google use the Facebook one, and it's kind of like a constant. <laughs> <laughs> now it's happened. Microsoft had their own, and then they all switched to PyTorch as well. So oh, no. they're, all got, they're all got dropped. That's just, yeah, that's just how it goes. So, but before we get into PyTorch, let's get into deep learning itself, how this works. Because this is, it is related to classical machine learning. If you use linear regression, you've already used machine learning. But deep learning is, has its extra steps. So let's say you have a data set of images and labels, of sound recordings and labels, of uh, images and segmentation, pixel wise annotations, of images and regression values, whatever. Data set with X, the input, and Y, the labels. What you do first is you load this data. Because deep learning uses such big data sets, you cannot put them all into memory. You load them one by one or batch by batch. If you remember Chase's lecture. You'll be the data augmentation. Jörn is going to talk about that later on. But what you do now is just say you load, let's say, for example, one data point, which I'm going to take the pixel by segmentation example, gives you an inch and the ground truth. You see on the left, that's a remote sending image in false color infrared, which is why everything is red. And on the right is a ground truth, which tells, in this case, it's segmentation. So it tells us for every pixel what the, what the land cover class is. It might be a single label, it might be something else. This really depends on your application. So for camera traps, you might have bounding boxes there. But here we're gonna have that, just for demo. And then what you have is your model. And the deep learning model, I guess you've heard a bit about it, you've maybe read a bit about it, is really is a is a stack of layers basically. We configure it and order it in a sensible way in quote marks that extract features. I'm not gonna go too much into detail on how this works. I guess we're gonna tackle that in the reading groups a bit more. But what you do is you take this image, you feed it through the model like you do with, for example, a random forest or a linear regression. And in deep learning terminology, this is called the forward pass. You put the image or the data point forward through the model. And then you get a prediction out. Exactly the same as in other machine learning models. So far, so good. Now this prediction, in this case, looks sensible. There's a bit of error, right? So what you want to do is you want to make this prediction as close as possible to your ground truth. That's the step by you learn on your data. Machine learning is just learning from data. And what you do is you compare the two, the prediction of the ground. And you do that by what's called a loss function. It's also called a criterion sometimes, but generally it's a loss function, or sometimes even just a loss. And there's multiple loss functions available. For example, for regression, you've heard of least squares. That's just, you take the square difference between your prediction and the ground truth, and you minimize that. Least squares, minimize the squares. For classification, there is others. One is called cross entropy, which is the most common. Uh, don't worry about that, it's all implemented in PyTorch. We can explain you how it works later. But in principle, you have different loss functions and you wanna choose that carefully for your, for your task. In this case, you're gonna use just cross entropy, it's not written, anyway, this gives us uh, this gives us, in the end, if you sum it all together over all the pixels, a single value which tells us how accurate is the model. If the output is zero, the model is perfect in every location. If the output is high, the model is really bad. And now we need to do something with this value. And what is the range? Of that this, honestly, this depends. 
you cannot say that in, in advance. It depends on whether you sum over your data points, whether you <coughs> divide by the number, what values you have. If your grant of, you say, let's say you do regression and your grant of is between zero and one. If you predict 10,000, the value could be 10,000. <coughs> if you predict zero, the value could be 0.5. You don't know. But it's not so important. But you want to now train this model. And the way, what, the way this is done is called the backward pass. Okay. So you see, we have the forward pass where we get the predictions, and we have the backward pass where we <coughs> change, where we adjust the model's parameters. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail how this works. We can have an extra lecture on that. But suffice to say, if you remember, I think it's calculus, if you remember first order derivatives from high school, you might. Can you imagine what's going on? You know, the derivatives gives you the direction of uh, this percent <coughs> the function. And what you do is you calculate the first order derivative of your loss, and then you want to minimize this loss. So you follow the you follow the direction into towards the zero. And you do that for every intermediate operation as well. And then you use the chain rule to back it. I'm not gonna make it I'm not gonna make it more detailed. This it's all implemented. You don't have to worry about that. And then what you do is you get what's called gradients, which is when you calculate this first order derivative with respect to your prediction at the ground truth, you get gradient values. And these tell you for every parameter in the model, you need to go into this direction, you need to go into that direction. And then you apply these gradients to the parameters. And so you iteratively refine the model so that it gets a little bit better the next time. So you cannot hammer down one data point and do it perfect. You could, but that would be foolish. What you do instead is you iterate over your data set over and over again. And each time you nudge the model a little bit so that it gets a little bit better next time. Yes. So in this instance, we're putting in this one image. Mm -hmm. But if we're uploading, let's say, 10,000 data points at once, mm -hmm. it, does, it happens in parallel. Is that correct? No, it actually happens uh, in it's sequence. One at a time. You iterate over your data set. So, so does it matter which ones we then put in first as like our baseline? Uh, let me ask you, what would you do if you have your, you have your data set sure. and you want to train the model? What, what order would make sense to present the training data points to the model? I mean, I, if I have, let's say I have five classes, then I would say one from one class, one from another class, one from another class, one from another class, and then do it like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. I don't, that's what that could be done. I don't know. That's what, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that could be done. So that it's not learning like one of my, if one of my classes is a species, it's not learning all of one species at once or, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's important. Is it important? That is important. Yes. Okay. Um, because if you put all the species first, then the model is just gonna it's just gonna fold attack those species and it's gonna forget about the rest, right? right? In a sense, the effect is not so bad, but there is a much simpler way of dealing with things, especially if your data set is large and high ID. Sure. Anyone has an idea? Oh, okay. Yeah. Just <laughs> that, makes, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> you just shuffle your training data set over. Sure. And you shuffle you, you shuffle it each time you make a you make a new pass over your data set. Okay. So just randomly expose the model to all the data points because it's it's actually quite a nice notion of fairness. You want to treat every data point with equal chance. So you if you treat them equally, you just uniformly randomize the role. That's what that's what everyone basically does. But I think one interesting thing here, and this is when I talked a little bit about ways that you might want to think about your, if you have very imbalanced data, mm -hmm. then what you were talking about is really true. Like you don't want the model to, well, so if you have 90% of your data is empty and, and you know 10% of it is the thing you care about, mm -hmm. even if you randomly sample, it's still only going to see the thing you care about like a little bit of the time. Right. And it might actually learn that it's like more important to just focus on the empties sure and actually it could really just learn to predict empty all the time yeah. and technically it would be correct 90 percent of the time sure right and so this is when sometimes then depending on data and depending on your imbalance you might actually forcefully over sample your positive examples or or cut or cap the amount of negative examples you show so that your model doesn't basically learn to ignore the thing you care about because you really could just cheat and say everything is negative and still get really close to minimizing. Costs. Right. Okay. Thank you.
Yeah, this can happen. I mean, I've done it myself. There's, for example, parentheses. There is an interesting concept of curriculum learning. Now you first you gradually expose the model to more difficult parts of your data set. Mm -hmm. And I've used this in finding animals in aerial images. Because I had this exact problem. Most of my drone images were empty. So the model was just predict there's never an animal. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I for the first, for the start of the model, I only took the images that had animals. So I dropped, I deliberately dropped parts of the data set to make the model focus on the animals. And then I gradually included the empty ones. And you have you can do that, but that works because as your model starts to learn, the signals become less strong in that the model starts to be somewhat good, and then it really needs a very bad misprediction or a bad label for the model to overturn. Yeah. So you kind of let the model settle in on the animals, for example, and then you it's still it's gonna be good at the animals, but it's gonna be bad on the background, and then you Settle in the rest on the background. You gradually expose it. You can do this. It doesn't always work, but in my case, it works too. Right. So, but in principle, this is the deep learning workflow. Sample data and labels. We make a forward pass. We get the predictions. We calculate a loss value. We do a backward pass, and we update the parameters. These four five steps. Let's look at a bit of side step. Deep learning, as you know, is everywhere. So if you browse on Amazon through related products, if you have a self-driving car, if you have a smartphone, if you have a Facebook account, you've been using probably 60 or 100 deep learning models already. Mm -hmm. So it's really everywhere. So it also has industry-grade applications. So there's, there's armadas of people optimizing deep learning models for, for example, a cell phone. But we're not there. So what we do, you can have the prototyping stage where you start training a deep learning model as a proof of concept or scientific applications. That's stuff like you can use Jupyter, Python, and maybe C++, whichever. Then you can have large-scale model training. That's, for example, the big ones, Google, Facebook, Amazon, which sometimes have models that take a nuclear power plant to train because they just scale up like crazy, but they have the infrastructure to do so. And then you have commercial implementations that run on your cell phone. But yeah, and then you can actually do this kind of loop if you want, but that's really very computer science ish. We are here and we're going to stay here because this allows us to make models that are of sufficient size and work for our data sets. We don't need to be running a camera trap model on a smartphone. That would be computer science, shit, software engineering. We stay here. Good. Now PyTorch, what is it and why? So you might have heard, you have heard of NumPy, which is for matrix operations. You might have heard of SkyPy, for example. PyTorch is this, basically. <laughs> so it has most of the NumPy functionality, almost all of it, but in its own tensor format. And it has, in addition, all of the deep learning stuff. So it allows you to design deep learning models to train them. It has parallelization and it allows you to also go into production. And this parallelization part is important. So you might have heard of GPUs that we use, or sorry, I mentioned TPUs yesterday. In principle, the idea here is that deep learning models are so big that you don't want to be running them on your processor, on your CPU. And so, for example, if you, the reason for that is that deep learning models have many more parameters to learn. Now, what is a parameter? So, if you have, let's take, for example, linear regression, AX plus B. A and B are the parameters. These are the ones you learn from your data. These are two. Deep learning models have millions, sometimes billions of parameters. And if you take a CPU on your computer, it has to go through each parameter separately, which takes forever. The good part is here is where you can parallelize, especially for images and also for all and so on. Most deep learning models are designed in such a way that you can apply the same operation at every location in, for example, your image. So if you have a CPU, it has to go through the, it starts to start at the top left corner of an image and go through it until it reaches the bottom right. What we can do instead is we can use a special processor that does all of those bam, at once. And that's, this we can do, for example, with a graphics processing unit. 
people have discovered this because these GPUs, they do these parallel operations. They have to render every pixel here. You don't want to go from pixel by pixel when you draw something on the screen. So you want to do the same operation everywhere. So these GPUs are good at this. And they're we, we can use them to optimize deep learning model execution. And it's going to be a factor of maybe 200. So it's a difference if your model takes five weeks or a day to run. And that's why later on, we're going to switch to virtual machines that have such a graphics processing unit attached to them. You might have wondered why you need a GPU if you only have a virtual machine. That's why. Applications like this. PyTorch allows us to use those very easily. Here's a little bit of a cheat sheet for you if you want that uh, tells you if you know NumPy operations, you have the PyTorch and the Torch tensor equivalent. There's more of those. I'm not going to go too much into detail. I'm going to give you the slides at the end so you can look those up if you want. But you can see it has the same operations built in. And as I said, it has this graphics processing unit support. But here's an example. So what we, what we do here is a mouse pointer. Anyway, let's make a quick example. First, we make a tensor, which is the PyTorch equivalent of a NumPy ND array. And we fill it with some random numbers. In this case, we give it the size three by four, just random numbers. At the moment, in the very first line, once we've executed this, we've made a class instance of a tensor that sits in system memory. And now we want to put this to the graphics part. It's very simple. You say tensor does CUDA. CUDA is the NVIDIA library for, for calculating stuff on the GPU that is not graphics. It's what PyTorch uses in the background. So we just say dot CUDA. We can also say tensor dot two and then specify the device. In this case, we put it on the first available GPU. If you have multiple graphics cards, you can say we put it on the first one, number zero or number one, whatever. And then we can do calculations here, the same as on the CPU, like for example, running for a deep learning model. And once we're done, we need to put it back in the system memory. So we just say dot CPU or dot two CPU. So the reason for that is that the conventional systems, you know, you have your processor and you have your memory where you store stuff like variables. And the graphics processing, the GPU has its own memory. It cannot access the system memory. So it does its own memory, it does its calculations on its own memory. So when you do stuff on the GPU, you need to transfer the variable content to the sit to the GPU memory, do your calculations and transfer it back to the system memory. That's just a bit of a historical artifact. It's going to change very soon, actually, because they're going to develop special things. We're going to use that. It's very fast. You will see. Any questions so far? So good. Yes. So if I understand right, basically, like the scripts that we currently run use our computers like RAM. Yes. And now we're switching to like a different part of the computer's brain. In a sense, you're still using both. Okay. You're going to still use the system memory. So, for example, you're going to load your data in system memory and you only put it on the graphics card memory when you do the deep learning operations mm -hmm. because gpu ram is limited it's a lot lower and you can get a memory overflow very quickly so you want to optimize this yeah it's just it's just two different parts of the computer that we're going to use one is optimized for parallelized operations one is optimized uh, optimized for difficult individual operations. We're going to make the best use of both. I'm going to give you an example of how this looks like. So let's actually do that. Let's dive in and go into this code folder you've seen in the beginning where you put all your Python scripts. So for deep learning, as a bare minimum, here's what I think you will need. You'll need a file called dataset.py where you put your data set uh, class. Makes sense, right? You need the model.py. Here's where you put your model class definition. So, for example, if you use a ResNet 50, here's this where you define it. And then you need the train.py. This is where you train your model. And this is more script organized. This is where you can pull in the data sets, create data sets instances, create model instances. And here's where you do the forward and the backward pass to train the model. And then you can have a test of pi where you actually test.
test the model or do prediction on the test portion of your data set. I think with these four, you're already covered. You're going to have some special ones depending on your code setup. You have some utilities and so on, but these are the core ones. Good, let's go into that. <laughs> this is a sample code for a PyTorch data set class. This is where you define how your data set is being loaded. You can see it's a class. I, call it, I just call it my data set here. Please name it something sensible. <laughs> And again, you see, you've asked this before, you see this round brackets data set. So this is a subclass of a torch data set class. And we just need that because then PyTorch recognizes it as a correct type of class. You have a constructor here with this def in it. And this is where you load our data. You see, we have self.data equals whatever. I haven't filled it in. This is where you basically not load your images, but you register which data points you have. You don't put them into memory yet. You just say, I have 10,000 images. These, these are the file names, for example. You don't, want to, you don't want to load images here because otherwise it's just going to get a memory overflow. We're going to do that later. The next thing this function, this PyTorch data set class needs is a length function. This underscore underscore len, again two underscores, this just tells you how many data points you have. So if you have defined self.data, it's just going to get the length of self.data. Very simple. And then to actually load a data point, we have this get item function. And this takes one argument, x or whatever. And this tells me, give me the item at position x. X is, a, x is an integer. So x could be zero, which means give me the very first data point. And we do that here. You see, we get the item from self to data at position x because it's a list. We load, here is where we actually load the image. So here we want to load the image or the audio uh, capture, whatever you have, into memory. Because this is when we need it for using it or usage in the deep learning. Mode. We transform it into a tensor. I will get into that later. We get the label. This is the ground truth. Let's assume we have that in item. And then we return both. We return the image and the label. Input, target. We return these two things. Very simple. Yes, thank you. So do these definitions have the double underscore because they're required or because they're like special names or? Because they're special names. Okay. <laughs> yes. So Python, some Python classes have some defaults. Len is one of those expected function names. If you call len on something, this is len on self.data. Self.data is a list. A list is a class. And this class list is going to have a len function. So when you call this, it's going to call that. It sounds a bit strange, but trust me, that's how it is. <laughs> so, so basically, like, um, the PyTorch has a data set class already defined that has a ton of built-in functionality. Um, it will, if you want to train on batches, it will then like load batches and make them all formatted in the right structure to be able to go into like models. It does like randomization, you can probe it. It has a ton of stuff already built in. You don't need to write any of that. Like it's already there. But what you do need to do is it has its own already like predefined initialization length get item functions, but they're basically empty. And so what you're doing is you're saying, I want to make a data set class, but my data set class is going to have everything of the other one, but we're just going to basically overwrite these like these these simple functions with our own versions of them that are related to our own data. But then you get all that other stuff for free. So it's called like class inheritance, basically. You're inheriting everything from that original class, and then you just change what you need to change. And you can go look in the code for PyTorch. You can look at that class and look at all the stuff it has built in. And you can overwrite any of those functions yourself just by using the same name from the original PyTorch class. And you can also make your own functions that are just for your stuff and add them so it can have additional stuff. Yeah. We will actually look into that. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so what if you didn't change the len? But I'm just confused why you have len in here because it looks like they already have the length function and all you're doing is returning the length function. So are you even changing anything? Can you imagine why? No, that's why I'm asking. So Sarah just said there is a base class. You can see we actually imported it at the top. There's a base data set class which has a length function built. 
Yeah, which you're calling here, aren't you? I'm not calling it. Oh. I'm. Oh, I see. Defining it. Wait, but then what? Are, you're Why am I redefining it? Wait, hold on. Are you returning the length of self dot data? So that the thing that you're returning in there, you're not calling. That you're calling another length function. Like, where, where's the length thing come from? Not the underscore one, the other it's one. Exactly. That's, in, that's a built in Python function okay. that just gets the length of a list. Okay. Yes. Okay. And Got our it. data here has been defined okay. as, as self.data, but we can define that ourselves too, right? Okay. Yeah. So the built in okay. function wouldn't know that we Got decided it. that our data was stored in self.data. Got it. We wouldn't know where to look. So we yeah. have to tell it where to look. Good, thank you, thank you. Um, so would this be helpful, this ability to overwrite? Like I noticed that the data set loader expects, I think your data to be in a certain format. Yeah. So if your data is not in that format, you can basically like do this. And then instead of having to like reformat all your data, you just like change this. Absolutely. Okay, I get it. So that's, it's called a custom data loader. And basically all of you will need one because honestly your data format is something that isn't like, yeah, it's gonna be its own thing. So I feel like I need to clarify one thing here that everyone is mixing up. The data set and the data loader are not the same thing. So what you do, your job is to define a data set class, which is a type which has these three functions. It lo it uh, produces all the data points you have. It tells you how long the data set is, how many data points there are, and it gives you a function to load one item. That's a data set class. It gives you an interface, say a function that tells you, I want to get item at position 10. The data loader is what calls this function. The data loader is the one that does all the batch composition, the randomization, the multi-threading. That's, you don't need to touch this. This is really a function. Yeah. But the data set is where you define what your data set looks like and also how you want to load your data. Okay, if you're, if there's any more questions, if you're good with that, very nice. We can do exactly the same. Yeah, so you see it again, I have some explanations here. We have constructor where you index the samples and uh, you don't load the data yet, because that would just crash memory. We have the number of samples that we return here. And here's where we actually load the item at position X. So usually you want to have your image as a torso tensor and your label also as a torso tensor or as an or as a or as an integer. Also. Then we do exactly the same for the mobile. This is our actual deep learning model. So again, we define a class. I'm just gonna call it Lynette because that was one of the first deep learning models we ever made. And this is another subclass of nn.module. A module is anything that has a forward and a backward class. A deep learning layer has a forward and a backward class. A deep learning model has a forward and a backward class. So it makes sense to clump that all together into nn.module. And here again, we have a constructor in it. And this, in this case, takes one argument num classes. So we define how many output classes it has. And then you start defining your layers. You, have, you can define a, a 2D convolution layer, for example. You see? It's another NN class. It's all in NN for neural network. And we're gonna get into details there. That's not so important for you to know now. It's just here is where you define the layers of your model. And if you scroll down, you have one more function, def forwards. This is where you define the forward class. So you get a data point X. In this case, this is, this is your image as a tensor. And here is where you define in which order and how you want to apply your layers to your data. And in the end, you return the output. So you define what the forward pass looks like of your model. So, so in the beginning in the constructor, we say, what layers does this model have? And here you say, in which order are they going to be executed? Is that clear? Very good. And you notice there's no backward function. And uh, there's a reason for that. Because I told you backward passes works with derivatives and so on. Uh, you don't have to code a single derivative because PyTorch does it for you. 
<laughs> I've, I've done it in the past with old framework, it was a nightmare. So you don't have to ever define a backward pass, which is pretty awesome. That's what's something called autograd, which means it automatically identifies the gradients. And again, we could fill another lecture on how this works. If you're interested, let me know. <laughs> but just suffice to say, you define the forward pass. You don't bother about the implementation too much. Good. That's the model. And then we have the train function. Here is where we actually finally train the model. And this has a number of steps. The first one is, you see at the top, we initialize stuff. So you see, I've made this clear before, the data set and the data loader is not the same. So at the top we have now a data set uh, instance. So you can imagine we, we can draw instances from the data set as well. I haven't shown this for very few reasons. So we have wrapped that in a data loader, which is going to give us batches of images or data pods in general. And then we have a model. So in this case, I just call it unit because I yeah, forgot to adjust the slides. In this case, we have a unit class. We create a model instance of unit. And then we have what's called an optimizer. Uh, anyone knows what an optimizer is? I've heard of it. How to make the bug propagation? Like they are, you are giving like the learning day, like not no learn a lot, and also like the gradient descent, the stochastic gradient descent. You are saying like don't, don't find a local, try to 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 find a. Yeah. It goes into that direction exactly. Yeah. So I told before that deep learning models are trained with. With, by calculating gradients based on the first order derivatives. You cannot just say apply these gradients to the model weights, could, for example, add them on top. But if you did like that, then they would be too strong and you wouldn't have control of what's happening because your model would just explode basically. <laughs> so you need to be very careful in how much and when and how you apply these gradients. And this task is being done by the optimizer. There's different reasons for that. Because for example, if you have, let's say a linear regression, then your loss function is the sum of squares. That's just a quadratic function. If you follow down the gradient, you can always follow down the gradient until you reach at the very minimum. Then you know you have reached what's called the global optimum. That is the, in, in a quadratic function, the, for example, y equals x squared, the point at zero is where you have the lowest value of the function, you cannot get any lower. That's the global optimum. With deep learning, we have millions of parameters. The function is very difficult. You, you're not sure if you can reach the global optimum. You can get into what's called a local optimum. Like if you have a little bit of a slope and then goes down. If you, if you are tracking this little bit of a slope, you cannot go further down. So your model is gonna be stuck in a bad configuration. And there's different ways of how to overcome this. And, one, and there's different, yeah, there's different ways. And one of them is what's called stochastic gradient descent, where you modulate the uh, the gradients with what's called a learning rate. So you first of all reduce them usually a little bit, so they're not too strong, so the model doesn't overfit to your current batch. And it also has some tricks involved that you can exit this local optima and actually go further down. It's again, it's research in its own. But there is two of them. One is called stochastic gradient descent, SGD. There's another one called Adam. I usually will, uh, advocate you to use one of the two. They work very well. So now we have these three things that we need. We have a data loader that loads data from our data set. We have a model and we have an optimizer. And now what we do, we iterate over our data set by calling the data loader. See that here? We make a for loop. We say for data and labels in data loader. Remember our data set class, we return the image tensor and the label tensor. That's data and labels. And then so we call that on the first batch. And then the first thing we do is we put those data on the GPU. Because now we want to use those for doing deep learning. And this we do on the GPU. So we say both of them dot CUDA. If you're confused by this common notation, that's just Python. It's just data and labels are data.cuda and labels.cuda. 
you can have them in two lines as well. So that's just the more lazy way of coding. And then you do the forward pass. Here is where you predict. You just call model on data. This gives you the prediction. That's if, you, if we have defined the forward function before, this gives you the output of that on all the data points in data. We calculate the loss. So we have a criteria. I haven't defined this here. We have a criterion function. This could be sum of squares, could be cross entropy. The loss function you have, where you compare the predictions with the labels, and this gives you a single value. This value here, this loss value, is a torch tensor. And this is a special tensor because this has all the prediction history of the model built in. All the gradients are built in because that's what Autograd does. PyTorch calculates the gradients as it moves along. And uh, like it calculates the intermediate steps that are used for the gradient calculation. Let's say that. Yes. Um, so it's a criterion, like a built-in function. Criterion, uh, in this case, it's another instance of the class. And the classes are the loss functions. Okay. So for example, you define the loss function? You define which loss, you say which loss function you want, or you define your own. For okay, example, there is one. Criteria. There's one called MSC loss, which means from stands for mean squared error. That's <coughs> the sum of squares. Will that be in which do we have a separate? That's, that's built into PyTorch. I'll show you an example. Which script? It's also in torch.nn, same as for the okay, right. Yeah, because okay. like it also has a forward and a back function. So mean loss function that you're probably likely to use, it's already been defined, and you just say which one you want to use. Yeah, I was just wondering where we say it, which one. Is it yeah. So you either would you either would define your own instance of a loss function and you can define that for yourself, or there are existing functions that are already built in, and then you would just say loss equals MSE error of yes. okay. Yes. Okay, it might be a dumb question, but if you so when you call model data, does it know to go to model.py if you have a separate script? Yes, because you import it at the top. Oh, okay. You can import your own functions and classes just like you can import existing libraries. Again, I'll show you at the end. <laughs> yes, you will know that. So you have your loss, get a single value, and then this next step here might sound weird, but what you do is uh, you call the optimizer that we have defined, stochastic gradient set, and say it does zero grad. What, what this does is it has to calculate gradients for every parameter of your model. By default, PyTorch leaves these gradients as they are. So what you need to do is, if you have gradients from a previous iteration, they're going to stay there. You don't want that. You only want the gradients for your current batch. And this function sets all the gradients to zero, so you can start again with a fresh set of no gradients at all. Yes, please. Is there some reason why it doesn't just do that automatically? Because, uh, yeah, there is, there is advantage to that. For example, you can do what's called graded accumulation, where you want to actively, you, for example, you can split your batch into small ones. If it doesn't fit into GPU memory, you can say, I want to do little batches one by one, accumulate the gradients, then do one big pass. Okay. It's rarely used. So other libraries, other deep learning implementations do this automatically. PyTorch doesn't. Okay. Gives you more flexibility, flexibility, one more line of code. Trade off. And then this is the magical backward pass line. So this is where you calculate the backward pass. And even though you've never defined it, because Torch defines it for you, you call this on loss. You say you start with the single loss value. And from there, you do what's called the back propagation through your model. Calculate all the gradients until you reach the input. And then when you have these gradients, you want to apply them to your model parameters in the correct way. And this is this optimizer.step function, the very last one. So here is where, in this case, stochastic gradient descent jumps in, takes these gradients, and modulates them with the learning rate, with whatever, and applies them to your model parameters. This is where your model starts learning, this step. And you see, we have this in the loop. We do this over and over again for all the batches. Yes, thank you. Why do we not need to then take the data back to the CPU before the next loop? Good question. 
because we redefine it here, it automatically gets uh, collected. So overwritten in the GPU memory. Yes. So in more hardcore programming languages like C++, you would have to do that, or you have a memory leak. In Python, you have what's called the garbage collector, which goes through and deletes variables you don't need anymore. You don't need to worry about this. Um, do you have maybe a suggestion of like a really simple GitHub repository, like the one that you showed us, just like a test here that we can uh, look at just as an example? Yes, I will go through it at the end. I will give it all to all. Oh. <laughs> I've actually hacked it together yesterday during the lecture, so. We'll have oh, it. wonderful. <laughs> yes. Um, I know that we kind of had a bit of a discussion here, but it kind of went over my head. Um, how are you calling? So. Did you like okay? So your data set here is something that you you created using the instance of my data set that you showed in your last slide, and then you pass it into the data loader. Yes. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly it. So this data, this lowercase data set, is an instance of my data set we defined. Yeah. Okay. And you pass it to the data loader. Okay. Thank you. Just didn't have enough space to put that. Sure. Well. Thanks. Yes. Leslie, so with this for loop, you can have two items because they're the same length. Is that how how can you do data labels in the for loop? So these data labels are the output of our data set classes get item function. Mm -hmm. And they usually have to be the same length because you want the same number of elements in uh, in all of your images and batches. If you have auxiliary information you need, you can return as many as you want. So in this case, we just have two because we have returned two, but you could return something else, a third thing, and then it would show up here as a third thing. You could add it. Yeah, I was just curious, like in the order that the for loop goes, it just goes through zero for both the data and labels and all of them at the same Yeah, exactly. So that's the that's what this data loader does. Mm -hmm. You know, it calls it calls the get item function of the data set for a couple of images. Or if you have a batch size of 16, it calls it for 16 images. For each of these 16 images, it gets, in this case, data and label, like a torch tensor and an integer, and it then stacks them together for you. So you get something ready, combined already across all the batch images in the batch. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I guess, like, coming from other types of like modeling frameworks, like, sklearn or something where you can kind of systematically test out different parameters and like optimizers and uh, you know stuff like that and be like a grid search or something is there like a way to do something similar with pytorch or is that like sort of nitpicky when it comes to deep learning models like so that's a good question there is two parts to this the first one is uh, should the first one is theoretical? Should you or how important is it to test different configurations? It's quite important. These are what's called hyper parameters, like for example, these parameters you don't learn but you set by hand, like for example, random forest, the number of trees. You have a million of those in deep learning and you want to test a couple of them. Uh, you definitely want to do that. The second question is how you do that. There is libraries which kind of promise to do that for you, like you give them ranges of parameters and you test them all. I don't know. I've never used them. Maybe Sarah has more experience. I just I basically I just basically uh, make a configuration and show you how to do that so you can test different experiments yourself. Okay. This is called hyperparameter tuning. And the way that people win capital competitions is they basically will train like a thousand different neural networks on their massive like sets of GPUs and get the one that's like 0.2% better than all the other ones. Um, for us, because we're just in a more resource limited scenario, and like every conservation organization, and honestly most academics are in a more resource limited scenario, they're not like at with Google scale compute. Um, we still do hyperparameter tuning, but we do it much more. So we don't just sort of blanket do a grid search because we just don't have the resources to go to that scale. So instead, um, I usually, there's like a few things that I will tune, like for example, like the loss rate, like basically how big of a step you take at every one of these, oh. every one of these gradient steps. Um, that can be something you wanna tune, but I'll try like three different values to start with, see how they go, 
make an intelligent decision about what to try next. So it's more selective. Um, yeah, and you're just you're not going to have like the resources to be able to launch a hundred GPUs in parallel and run a grid search over a hundred different possible models. So I think you're going to just do that a bit more uh, handcrafted way. Right. Yeah. This is what we're going to be doing. So on the principle, that's the core. That's the core training process of people. These lines. And also, you see again about the question of when you do what. You do the data loading on the CPU. You do the deep learning stuff on the GPU, and you you really exploit all the resources you have because the data loader is multi-threaded. You can say with numbers that's the number of processes you want to use to load the data. So you can op you can tune that for maximum speed. With that, you really make your computer use all of the resources it has. And Python allows you to do that very easily. So um, I'm going to go just briefly into some pitfalls with PyTorch so that you're aware in case something you're surprised. Let's say this. Let's take this example and make this a bit more interactive. We define two tensors here, A and B. And then we want to multiply them, A multiplied by B. This doesn't work, I'll tell you. Can anyone tell me why this doesn't work? Is B stored in the GPU or? First one, very good. A <laughs> is on the CPU, B is on the GPU because of that CUDA. That's why. It's not the only reason. Yes? They're not the same size? They're not the same size. One is 3 by 12, the other is 4 by 12. Yeah, you cannot multiply that. Side. I'm not working with you. There's but one more reason. Yes, you will. <laughs> All right. All right. They're a different class type. Exactly, there are different number types. The first one is floating point, the second is long, which means double precision integer. So 64 bit. But these are exactly the reason why this doesn't work. We have not the same size, not the same number type, and not the same device. So if you wanted to fix, I mean, you would have to start over if you wanted to fix this. <laughs> but, but these are the three reasons, right? Second case. Why does this not work? Yeah, okay. <laughs> because it's in the GPU and you can't put numpies in GPU. Exactly. NumPy doesn't understand the GPU. It's all in system memory. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to fix this, yeah, it's still in GPU. If you wanted to fix this, what would you do? Very easy. Take it back into system memory. And how do you do that? CPU, yeah. We call dot CPU dot numpy, then it works. Third one. That's I'm gonna give you the reason already. You cannot do a double back <laughs> for That's just a security mechanism because it doesn't make any sense usually. Hey everyone, I'm so sorry. I have to go take a meeting. Um, but uh and you're in very good hands with Benny, and I'll check in with everyone as soon as I'm back. Bye. Bye. See you. Uh, you still fit now, uh, fit and attentive. Otherwise, we can take a little break. I don't know. If you're good, we gotta continue. How much more is it? <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> five-minute break might be nice. Yeah, I mean it's, it's quite a bunch. So I think that once we have that finished, let's take a five-minute break and then we continue. Yeah, you're happy. Great. Yeah. Very good. So here, double backward process never makes sense. Very rarely they do, but by default you cannot do this. You can allow this by with a special keyword, but you don't ever need that. So just saying, don't call backward twice. It's not a complaint. Now, there is some more specialities. This autograd is what I said, is it calculates the backward pass for you. This is very resource intensive because it has to keep intermediate prediction values in memory. So for, if, you have, if your model has 100 layers, it has to keep for every 100 of these 100 layers, it has to keep its output in, in GPU memory. That explodes, and it's also very slow. So you only want to do this during training, when you need these intermediate predictions to calculate the gradients. When you're testing the model, no learning involved. You don't need that. You just need the end result, and that's it. What you can do then is, in principle, say, dot detach. So for example, in this case, 
you can chain models together. Let's say you have model one, you apply that on data, you get pred one. And then you have a second model and you want to apply this on pred one. You want to have, mm -hmm. you want to apply this on the output of the first model. You can do that. For example, the first model could be mega detect. The second model is a classifier. That's, an, that's a plausible scenario. And in this case, let's say you only want to train the second model, the classifier. You don't want to train mega detect. What you can do is call dot detach, which means it, it gets detached from the gradient graph that PyTorch constructs in the background. And that means that it just stops back propagation. So when you call, when you call, when you use this in a loss and you call loss to backwards, it calculates the gradients from model two, but then it stops. That's very handy. And most of you are going to have one model. There's something even nicer. You just say this special keyword in Python that's useful with torch.nograd. And then when you calculate the prediction here, you just get the prediction, no gradients. This is going to be twice as fast and going to use half as much memory as if you did it without it. These to use for getting predictions from your model in test phase. Use that. It's immensely useful. Mm. And last but not least, check the documentation. It's very good in PyTorch. It's very extensive and uh, it's easy, easy to understand. You will find many answers to almost all of your questions in there. Make use of the documentation, please. And if not, ask us or of each other as you. Let's take a five minute break here. Let's say we reconvene at, I don't know, 10 past 11. Is that good? Yeah. I mean a break. <laughs> I guess I'm going to the batches. Is it that you're loading up the data batch cycle? One, you're doing you know, you're one data point, you're doing that computation on that. Five, you're putting all five of those, and you're doing that computation once with all five. Is that yes, how it works? Exactly. Why would you like to get that five with Okay, so in principle, you want to increase your batch size because if you just optimize on one data point at a time, mm -hmm. You are very sensitive to either data. So you're very sensitive to what the data looks like around. Yes, do what you kind of zigzag around. Multiple data points, it kind of gives you a better gist of what the data looks like. So your gradients are more streamlined. You can have two large batch sizes. Yeah. I mean, some people have said, ideally, your batch size would be this. I don't know. I disagree. Deep learning, you yeah, can yeah. have two large batch sizes, but the gradients just yeah. cancel each other out. Uh -huh. So you want to set it sensibly. Usually, set it so that it yeah. kind of exploits your GPU as much as possible. Yeah. So, okay. there's a, how, how would you do it? How might you determine that? Yeah. Check the yeah. GPU needs. <laughs> it also depends if you have, you can have experimental to your batch connect with your disk. And if it takes too much time to, too much effort to load as an initial disk, your batch size is too large. You have to wait until all the images yeah. are loaded until you can do the, the deep learning training process. Okay. In that case, you waste a lot of time by waiting for the disk to load. In that case, you want to reduce the batch size. So it has to load less stuff, put it on the GPU. I would do it for memory and speed efficiency. At least you can monitor. <laughs> Something for the speaker to be outside. Oh, okay. Now I emailed to, to the building manager. I was working from home. Day, so, I so there's two things about the uh, about it. Oh, is it Melanie here or Alex? I was trying to. I got I got here later. Than I thought. Separate from that. So the, so this is there's this building. This room. I don't know what's happening. I see my 
So I still have these two blocks. I'm gonna go through that one. This one I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna give them the reference, and then I go through the live demo. Okay. It's still a little bit of like 30 minutes. Yeah, I guess. Let's see. I've never, I've never tried it. So. Yeah. 
So let's continue. Yeah. He was, you know, just being fostered by the, like, you know, by people working here in the local county. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's different for sure. Yeah, yeah. That was great. I feel like my cat is my weird roommate, but my puppy is like crazy. Aww. Okay. Is there a way to... Right, let's do this, y'all. Yeah. Like a friend. Like a pump here. Yeah, I'm like, oh, God. skip the last one i'm going to give it to you on the slides for reference but this one i'm going to go through and then we're going to recap it all in some sort of a live day so hyperparameters i've been telling you these are the parameters you set by yourself and you tune without actually learning them and for deep learning we have a bunch again regular parameters are what's being learned i've brought up the example linear regression ax plus b a and b are the parameters Deep learning has millions of them. Hyperparameters is what is set by you. And uh, I'm going to give you a list afterwards of typical ones you might want to set. And it actually is a bit of a part and a major part of training deep learning models. And it is not so straightforward because you don't have a 
So you have some guidelines, but you don't always have your uh, clear heuristics on how you set hyperparameters. Many times when you ask machine learning people on why they came up with such a great model and what was the rationale for setting hyperparameters, they're sort of like, Bleh. <laughs> they just try, trial and error. It's usually when you read in the paper, it empirically works best, then you know they have just tried, and everyone does it. But there is some standards. So again, long list, not gonna go through that in detail now, I'm gonna give it to you for reference, but you see stuff like number of epochs, batch size we have talked about, which optimizer to use is also a hyperparameter. I can I put some defaults in here, there's more, but uh, this really depends on your project, on your data set, on your model, on your objective. If you, I, my, my take here is start with the details and adjust as you move along. At some point, you're going to get a feeling for that. So how do you actually test out different hyperparameters in your code in PyTorch? So in one way, Doing is like, for example, when you define your optimizer, you just hard assign there in the code. See, you have LR, the learning rate, 10 to the power of minus three, weight decay, same value, fine, right? Sounds plausible. That's garbage. Please don't ever do this. <laughs> this is the worst. Because <laughs> imagine you're going to have dozens of them in, in training deep learning models. If you have them somewhere in the middle of your code, this becomes unmanageable because you're going to forget what you've said somewhere because you don't know. You always have to search them when you need to change them. You cannot compare different experiments because at some point you're going to maybe set the learning rate uh, one dimension smaller and then you forget that. So if you do that in the code, it's bad. Just as almost as bad is when you define them at the top of your script. That's a bit better, but it's also not very good because you still need to change your code to change the parameters. That's not how you should do this. You can do, you have to do that in Jupyter, probably, but there's a better way of doing it in general. So one way of doing that is by what's called an argument parser. Hmm. Now, what is that? When you launch a command line interface, for example, I don't know if you've used the AWS CLI or Azure Copy, you gave it arguments. Or for example, if you said conda create dash n name, that dash n name is an argument, a command line argument, because you invoke the function from the command line and you specify, you feed it with arguments, right? Or copy, you want to copy one file from one location to another. You give, you say CP, first path, second path. These two paths are argument, command line arguments. You can do exactly the same in Python. You can say Python, train.py and then give it arguments. And you need to parse them in Python. And you can do that with what's called an argument parse, this arg parse. Again, that's a class. And it's best you, you load this class up with arguments. Here, for example, LR for learning rate. You can say what type it is, you can give it a default. And then you can actually, when you initialize your optimizer, you could say it is the arguments is called LR. And with that, you can really say, call your function python train.py dash dash lr, give it a value. So, you, so your values are independent from your code. That is better. And many people do that. Then there's people who are lazy and modify the defaults. And then you have the same problem again. There is an even better way of doing things, I believe. It's, again, it's individual. That's what I recommend. And at least I use configuration files. You remember the YAML we had for the code environment? YAML is just a way of putting configurations down. You can use that format for parameters. So here, for example, you can have a, a YAML file which has sections, train, and test. You could say the learning rate is this, the weight decay is that. You can specify all of your hyperparameters in a single configuration file. And then what you do is you call your training function with that configuration file as an argument, and it loads it from there. And you can create as many configuration files as you want. You want to try, you want to have an experiment where you try a different learning rate. You just make a different configuration file with a different learning rate. And all this, the rest stays the same. And with that, you have 100% knowledge about which parameters you've used. 
and you can specify anything in here, like which data set you use, what batch size, whatever. So with this, if you have these configuration files, you have full reproducibility. And as of course, you have to install a package for that. It's called PyYaml, very simple. Add it to your requirements file and you're good. And you can combine the two. So you can really say you have a config configuration file, for example, in a dedicated config folder. Name it properly, not my experiment, but name it according to experiment names with all your parameters. And in your train function, you have your argument parse, you specify where the config is, and your load is. And with that, you have all your hyperparameters in one place. I'll give you an example code on what this looks like. That actually already is an example code, but I'll give you the red one. So with that, you can really organize experiments and separate hyperparameters from the implementation. So you have maximum reproducibility, and you know six months later what you have been doing. Because we all have been there, we've forgotten parameters, and we try <laughs> to replicate moles, and we had this before a paper deadline, and suddenly a model didn't work anymore, and we forgot what we have, what we have been doing. Oh, no. <laughs> it's really bad. It's really bad. You can get your paper rejected. Because you suddenly, if you can't reproduce your results you claim for the revision, you're screwed. With this, you're not. Because with this, you know what you've been doing. Again, a bit of extra work in the beginning saves you from a lot of trouble later on. Good. This, I said, I'm going to skip. I'm going to leave this to you to explore. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to recap all of these points and show you that in live in a workspace. And actually, I have been doing that. That's what I've been doing yesterday in the mm -hmm. lecture. You see, it's in our GitHub repo. So you should have, uh, it's currently private. I'm not going to make it public, but you're going to have access to it. And uh, it's a repo that trains a deep learning model on camera trap images. So let's go through it. First of all, you have this read, you have the structure, you're going to get into that later. You have a readme. Which has a title, a bit of an explanation, installation instructions, and then how to reproduce results. Of course, it's only partially filled out, but <laughs> you're gonna get the idea. So let's use that. Let's open our code editor and start using this thing. First things first. Uh, I need to connect to my machine for this. Outside, we take a while if VPN is still active. Very good. Okay, so let's simply just start by cloning the environment. So copy this and you say git clone. Load. There we go. Let's open the folder. You should be familiar with git clone, I guess. We have been using that all the time. And here we go. So here's the repo that we have just downloaded. And uh, one of the steps it says here, for example, is to install Conda. I have that already on my machine. And we can create the environment. So we just, I don't know. We see we have the environment we use Python 3.8. So let's just quickly do that. Doing that now, and then we're gonna activate it, of course. And now we just install the requirements. You see, we have a requirements.txt file. So we just say pip install and then command line argument dash r read the contents of the requirements file. So let's do that. And while this is turning away, we can actually take a look at this file. This is what I added. We have PyYaml for reading the config files, we have this for a progress bar. Uh, you will see that in the last slides. And then we have PyTorch. And we have nailed it down to version 1.9.0. Good. So you see, it's actually downloading all the libraries for me in the background. Again, I have specified this in the repo. You cannot go wrong. You can exactly reproduce the environment I used for when I created that project. Yes, Tiziana. You write that in the script. 
not on the terminal. Because this, I keep going back to the terminal to write that. But can I write it in the script? The pip install. No. That's in the terminal. That's in the terminal. The command terminal. Okay. Yes, you see here, this is VS Studio Code. In the bottom here, it says terminal. Yeah. So it has installed all the libraries that we needed. Good. Next step. What does it say? Download the data set. Okay, we're going to use the Azure Copy command line tool. I have that already installed as well. So we can just basically, again, execute that line. And we can again check what actually is in that script. It's on the script, download data set. I've just made this. So it's going to put stuff into a folder called dataset slash Caltech CT. And it's going to start downloading stuff. And indeed, it has made this folder here and it's downloading. And importantly, because we're putting this into the project repo, if you open the .git ignore, we'll see that we have data sets in here. So this doesn't get pushed back to the GitHub repo. Very simple. That's how you can put your data set in the code folder without having to worry that it gets pushed to GitHub. So this is going to take a little while. In the meantime, we can explore the rest in that repo. So what we have here is See, we have different folders. We have the configuration folders where we put all of our YAML files. We have the actual code folder. We're going to get into that. We have the scripts folder that I made, so just download the data. We have the git ignore file. We have the license file. I talked about this in the beginning. And if you open this, you will see that this is just this is an MIT license, and GitHub has automatically understood it. It tells you what you can do. And it just it parses this by itself. So add a license, and then everyone knows what you can do with your code. You have this readme file that we're reading here, and you have the requirements files. Very good. And if you go into this code folder, while this terminal is doing stuff down here, if you into the CT classifier folder, you see we have a couple of files here. We have a dataset file, a model file, and a training file. We're missing the test file because I just didn't create it, I'm too lazy. <laughs> but we can go into this. So let's open the data set file. I, I always like to put a bit of a copyrighted info statement in the beginning. Also put your name here. So to make sure it is actually you who has created this. And then you see we are importing some stuff here. And then we have a class called CT dataset that inherits from the Torch, high torch data set. And this has this init function, which is the constructor. In this case, we're just giving two arguments, I mean, apart from self. We're giving the configuration, the YAML contents. So which has all of our hyperparameters because we can specify data set stuff in the configuration file too. And we're telling it in this case that we just, uh, what kind of split we want to use, train while test. Remember Sarah's lecture yesterday. And then of course, what we do, here is the set of some stuff, and we load our data. It, so you don't need to care about the details here. It's just we load the data based on the data set we've just been downloading in the background. Then we have the length function, which returns the length of self.data. We define self.data as a list here in the constructor. And down here is where we return the length. And then we have this get item function that I talked about which takes a uh, value called index, which is a number, an integer. We refer the image name and the label that we store in save.data. Here is where we actually load the image. We transform it into a PyTorch tensor, and then we return the tensor and the label. We return two values from this get item. And if you go into train, we're going to see we're going to reuse those two values. Then model. Here's where we define our models. Again, preamble bit of uh, explanation. In this case, we're going to use a ResNet 18. We have a class again, which inherits from nn.module. It has a constructor. We just give it the number of classes as an argument. And here is where we define our ResNet 18. And just for it to let you know, you can set, you can import ResNet from PyTorch, set pre-trained equals true, and then you get ImageNet, ImageNet initialized ResNet 18. Same for ResNet 50, ResNet 152, whatever. That's it's a one liner to get pre trained ResNets. And then we need to change some stuff here because ImageNet has a thousand classes. We only need some classes. So we create a new linear layer to map from our ResNet output 
to the number of classes we have. So we have two things here. We have self.feature extractor and the self.classifier. Then we use one by one. And we do that in the forward class. We get an input X. We extract some features by running the feature extractor on X. And we get predictions by running the classifier on these features. That's our forward class. And this self.feature extractor is the entire ResNet 18 until the penultimate layer, which we defined in the constructor. Clear so far? Casey. So you're only estimating the parameters of that last layer and you're keeping all the other ones like fixed, is that right? Or uh, yeah. you're... at this point, you're not keeping a fixed, you just you initialize the ResNet 18 with the uh -huh. image net parameters. Okay. Apart from the last layer. You, we don't have any initialization here, so it just gets randomly initialized. Okay. That's common practice. This is transfer learning, fine tuning, whatever. You replace the last layer with one that maps to your number of output classes. Okay. But everything else before that, you initialize with ImageNet. Okay. In this case. So we have our dataset class, we have a model class. And now we can look into the train script. Again, preamble. Some imports. You can see we import some Python packages, we import Torch, and we import, that's, I think that was your question, we import our classes. We import from dataset our CT dataset class, and from model we import our custom Reddit 80. So you can import your own classes even if they're in different files. You can also import functions and stuff. But we need this. And then we this is a bit more script style, but we still we organize function, we organize code into logical functions. The so one is, for example, we create a data loader. See, we have a function called create data loader. We tell which split it is. We first create a data set instance, and then we call PyTorch data loader, and we see, and then here we give it a data set instance. And here is where we get the hyperparameters. Like we have to tell the data loader what a batch size is, how many images to load. So we have this configuration as an input argument, which is from our YAML file. And here we say we want to get argument batch size. We can tell it to shuffle. That's, I think that was also a question. We shuffle during training. And here we can also tell how many workers we have. So we have multi-threaded data loader. And we return the data loader. And you see again, it's not a class here, but it's a function. One function we can use for both the training and the validation data. Very easy. You define it once, you reuse it twice. We do exactly the same with the model. Initialize an instance of our custom ResNet 18 and we give it the number of classes we defined before. There is a little bit of stuff to load the parameters, which is going to be the slides at the end. But in the end, we return the model instance and which epoch we currently are. We have some function to save the model. Same for the, op for the optimizer. Optimizer needs hyperparameters like the learning rate, and it needs the model. We say we're going to use SDG, SGD, so custom gradient descent. We initialize with the model parameters, our hyperparameters, and we return it. And then here is our magical train function, which we have seen in the slides as well. Again, we put everything on, we put the model, we need to put the model on the GPU as well, on the graphics card. We create a criterion, that's the loss function. That was, I think, Peggy asked about that. We're going to use a built in one, cross entropy loss, built into PyTorch for classification. And we do some running average, we track some stats here, like our overall accuracy and the loss. We track them. And then here we have our iterator, our loop over the training set. Uh, so we, enumer we, load, we loop over the data loader and we get our data and labels, which we returned in the get item function of our data set. We put them on the GPU, we make a forward pass, we reset the gradients to zero, iTorch needs that. We calculate the loss by using this criterion instance, the cross entropy loss here. We calculate the backward pass, we apply the gradients to the, to the model parameters, so we make the step. And then we do some statistics that we also can plot. That's it. Then we have a validate function, which we need. We also want to validate on a validation set every time. We do exactly the same, except that here we have a with torch dot no graph. Remember, we don't want any back for pass. And we have no optimizer. We have the criterion because we want to calculate the loss. 
but we have no loss dot backward, no optimizer dot step, because we don't do training here. We just do prediction, and again logging. And then at the end is our main function. We have our argument parser, remember? And here we have one argument, which is the config. And this is the path to the configuration file. The default is this here. You see, that file is here. That file is here. We load this config with YAML into CFG, and then we go through the steps. We check if we can have a CUDA device, if we have a graphics card. We, we create our training data loader. We create our validation data loader. Same function, different arguments. We, we load our model. We create the optimizer with the model and the configuration. And then we loop over the number of, the, over the number of epochs we have. So this train function just does one epoch, one pass over the full training set. We want to do like 100 passes over our training set. So we do that here. We first call the train function. We train the model with the optimizer. We call the validate function without the optimizer. We save the model. And that's it. This code trains a deep learning model for you. <laughs> so let's see. We have finished downloading the data set. So what we need to do now is we need to select the new content environment we created, which is this one here, CV for ecology. And let's create, let's just run this. So you should be able to just run this train function because if you check on GitHub, reproduce results, we have we can calculate, we can execute a train.py function. And because we have the default config, it's already in here. Um, we have a default here. This config, by the way, looks like this, this YAML file. We have comments. And here we have the parameters. We have the data set parameters, like how many classes you have, where, where the images are. And we have hyperparameters, like the learning rate. So you can really, you can save it in here. And if you want a different config, copy the file, modify the parameters, do done. So let's use this. Let's just call this function. Let's see what happens. And there we go. It said it's, it, it's using a, it's starting a new model. And here we go. Now it's going through uh, the training function, you see. It's actually pretty slow because there was something going wrong with the CUDA installation. Uh, it worked yesterday, as usual. <laughs> but in principle, you see we're having a progress bar here. You see how many batches are left, and you get the loss value, you get the overall accuracy, and this is going to go up. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> and what we can do now is we can set a breakpoint here, for example. That's the training function. Yeah. So now the code has stopped here because of breakpoints. That's how code editor works. Um, we have here data and labels. Let's make some tests. You have been in Jason's lecture on Monday. Who can tell me how, what data and labels, what they look like? Size, for example. Anyone has an idea? Let me put the hyperparameters uh, to the side here. So we have a configuration file on the right. You see stuff like, for example, our batch size. And then you should be able to say how big data and labels are. With this and this. Can you make the text a bit bigger? Yeah. It's a bit smaller. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't put it on there. Here. Is that better? Still too small? Sorry, I, I forgot about that. You should have told me. <laughs> so we are here in the middle of this training loop, which is post execution, so we can take a look. Data and labels, if you remember Jason's lecture, are of a particular size in that we have. Remember, these are batches of images in this case. So, yeah. The data would be 128 by 224 by 224. And the labels would just be 128. Very good. Almost perfect. Exactly. There is, yeah, no, you're good. You got it. 
it's just let's check data dot size. You see, we have four dimensions. And why do we have the fourth one? We have 128, which is remember the, the, the leftmost 128 is our batch size, right? Then we have three. What is three? RGB. 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 Nothing's free, it's RGB. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if you're working on remote sending data, you might have 18. If you work with grayscale images, you might have one. And then since it's images, we have width and height, 224 by 224. And labels, you were 100% correct. It's just 128. And you can look into that. Labels, let's oh, check yeah. it. These are our index, indexes, indices. These are our class labels. And of course, we could look into data, but it would just be a, a big mess, yeah. And this is in difference to, for example, if we set another breakpoint in the data sets get item function. So let's execute this and wait until we end up here. So now we are here in the get item function. If you check here, label, it's just one. It's one value because that's for one image. And of course, image tensor. Is a tensor that's three by three, 224 by 224, because it's one image. So, what the data loader does, it takes these 128 images and it stacks them together and adds a fourth dimension in the beginning. It does it for you, so you don't have to worry. Yes, I don't really understand what the 128 is, the batch size. Okay, the batch size. So, it is exactly what it says in that you iterate over your data set in batches. You don't iterate data point by data point. What you want to do is you want to combine multiple data points into one forward pass. And the reason you want to do this is, you know, deep learning works by gradients. If you only have one data point, it's gradients, the gradients are kind of a bit sketchy because one data point is not going to tell you a lot about the data set. It's kind of a you know, you want to have an overview over your data set at once. Because if you just have one data point, your gradients are going to go in all directions every time. So the model doesn't really know where to go. If you have multiple, your gradients get averaged, smoothed out, and streamlined towards the mean. So is that a fairly arbitrary number, 128? So the number depends on a lot of factors. First of all, it depends on how much GPU memory you've got. It also depends on how big your data size data set is, like your images are. It depends on how big your model is. It depends on the objective. You can have batch sizes of two or one for, for example, object detection. You can have batch sizes of 4,000 for very small images. Start with 128. If you, real, if you feel that your memory, you're going out of memory, then switch. Actually, let's take a look at that because I can switch to another environment where uh, the GPU should work. Let's try that again and write it on the GPU. So let's see. So in this code here, you see that this progress bar also gives you a speed indicator, I think. It was, you can see, you saw it was very slow. So let's try again if we have the GPU. I hope this works. No, it's not. It's not on the GPU. Just a moment. Yeah. Okay. Very common. My NVIDIA driver crashed, so I don't have a GPU. I cannot demonstrate it to you. But in principle, you want to be running stuff on the GPU, and then you have the tools to check how much memory you use, and and so on. But the batch size you want to set so that. It's a trade-off. You want to set it so that your GPU memory doesn't overflow, and you want to set it so that you don't have a bottleneck. Because if you set it too large, your disk might be too slow to load all these data points. Because then you have to wait. If you have a batch size of 10,000, you have to wait until your hard drive has loaded all the images until you can do the forward pass. And you don't want that. So you want to find the trade-off that is Good, not too small and not too big. You're gonna experiment that, it depends on your virtual machine. You'll figure that out if you have a timer like this progress bar, which I have in the slides. But in principle, yeah, that's all there is. And of course, if you have this code setup, what you can also do is you can 
for example, if you want to mix Python scripts and Jupyter notebooks, you can also do that, right? So you can, for example, have a notebook that visualizes predictions, and here you can also load the configuration mm -hmm. file. You can also do everything in Jupyter notebook. Really pick the one that you that sounds most familiar to you. This is really just how I do stuff. Doesn't mean that it's universally the right thing to do. All that is what I want to say is organize your code so that you can reproduce it even when you haven't touched it in a, in a year. It's very important. But this code uh, repo I'm going to give to you. I'm going to make it public. So I'm including the slides. And I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, we have some more stuff you can browse through if you want and how to progress monitoring, how to save models. But these kind of more as a reference. So I don't know, are there any questions? If there's none left, I would suggest <laughs> yeah. we go for lunch. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs>